Hello everyone, welcome to the daily editorial analysis of the Shankar AS Academy and today's date is 11-08-2024. Displayed here are the list of important articles that we would be discussing today from the Hindu and the Indian Express newspaper editorial section. So without any much further delay, let's get into the articles discussion one by one. Before getting into the article, let us look at the main question according to this article. Discuss the significance of the recent amendments to the WAF Act in India. Critically analyze the impact of these changes on the management of WAF properties, considering the perspectives of various stakeholders involved. Also examine the potential challenges that might arise in the implementation of these amendments. Since it's a very new topic, and a very new news to be covered. This question can be a basic structure on how a mains question can come on this recent news. So to answer this, let us see how the article is formed. Moving to the first editorial news for the day. A recent amendment bill, which is the WAF Amendment Bill 2024, was introduced in Lok Sabha on August 8, 2024. It amends the WAF Act 1995. The Act regulates WAF property in India. Opposition claims that this amendment bill will strip the Muslim community of their land, assets and the freedom to manage religious affairs guaranteed under Article 26 of the Indian Constitution. First, let us see what is a WAF Act 1995 is. The Act defines WAF as an endowment of movable or immovable property for purposes considered pious, religious or charitable under Muslim law. Under this act, every state is required to constitute a WAF board to manage WAF. WAF boards, it is a legally entitled entity responsible for managing WAF properties. What is a Central WAF Council? The Central WAF Council, CWC, it is a statutory body under the WAF Act 1995. It works under the administrative control of the Ministry of Minority Affairs. The union minister in charge of WAF is the ex officio chair person of the council. This council advises the central and the state governments on the WAF boards across India on issues of due administration of AFOC, that is assets that are donated or purchased and are socially charitable and working of the WAF boards. This is the function of this council. Let us see the key changes brought by the WAF Amendment Bill 2024. The bill proposes several significant changes to the existing WAF Act 1995. It includes renaming of the Act. The bill renames the WAF Act to United WAF Management, Empowerment, Efficiency and Development Act 1995. The bill allows for the appointment of a non-Muslim as the CEO of WAF Board. The CEO must be at least at the rank of Joint Secretary to the state government and the requirement for the CEO to be Muslim has been omitted. Now having separate WAF boards for Bohara and Agha Khani. The act allows establishing separate WAF boards for Sunni and Shia Muslims if Shia WAF com constitutes more than 15% of all WAF properties or WAF income in the state. Next is the donation rights. According to the new bill, only practicing Muslims can donate their property movable or otherwise to the WAF council or board. Only the legal owner can make this decision. Women and non-Muslim in boards. The bill proposes that the central WAF and the state WAF boards must have at least two women on the boards and at least two non-Muslim members appointed by the state government to the WAF boards at the state level. Next is the role of district collector as arbitrator. The district collector will be the arbitrator in determining whether a property is WAF property or government land. This changes the current practice where the WAF tribunal had the exclusive authority to make such determinations. Next is the audit authority. The bill empowers the union government to direct audits of any WAF property at any time by an auditor appointed by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India or another designated officer. Next is the central portal requirement. All WAFs registered under the WAF Act 1995 must file their details on a central portal within six months of the new Act's commencement. This includes information on property identification, boundaries, current use, income, management and other relevant details. Now let us look at the key concerns regarding the amendment. 
first is the dilution of muslim representation allowing a non muslim ceo would reduce muslim control over waf properties traditionally managed by the community this change is seen as undermining the religious and cultural leadership within waf boards next is the increased government control the district collector instead of the waf tribunal will decide if land is waf or government property this could lead to government interference and potential misuse of power over waf assets next is the centralization of data requiring waf details on a central portal raises privacy concerns and the risk of government control over this data there is fear that this could lead to further interference in waf management next is the impact on religious rights the amendments may infringe on the muslim community's ability to manage its religious endowments according to the islamic principles this could be seen as an encroachment on religious rights and finally is the exclusion of community stakeholders the new composition of the central waf council might reduce muslim influence in managing waf assets this change could diminish the community's role in decision making processes Now let us see the last article for the video. The article addresses the dangers of antibiotic misuse, highlighting its role in antimicrobial resistance that is AMR and the disruption of gut microbiota which can lead to widespread health issues. It emphasizes the need for responsible antibiotic use to protect both drug effectiveness and microbiome health. First let us see a main question related to this topic. discuss the major causes of antimicrobial resistance in india and the global context what are the potential health and economic impacts of amr and suggest effective measures to combat this growing threat it's a very direct question so first let us see the article formation to answer this question what is gut microbiota the gut microbiota refers to the diverse community of microorganisms residing in the gastrointestinal tract These include bacteria, viruses, fungi and the archaea with bacteria being the most abundant. The gut microbiota plays a crucial role in various bodily functions. First, digestion and metabolism. Gut bacteria aid in the breakdown of complex carbohydrates, fibers and proteins, allowing the body to extract essential nutrients. Next is the immune system support. The gut microbiota helps modulate the immune system enhancing the body's ability to fight infectious and maintain immune tolerance. Third is the production of essential nutrients. Certain gut bacteria synthesize vitamins like vitamin K and B vitamins which are vital for various physiological functions. Fourth is the protection against pathogens. A healthy microbiota competes with harmful microorganisms for nutrients and attachment sites helping to prevent infections. And finally, gut brain axis. The gut microbiota communicates with the central nervous system influencing mood, cognition and mental health throughout the gut brain axis. Now let us see what is antimicrobial resistance. The AMR occurs when microorganisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites evolve mechanisms to resist the effects of antimicrobial drugs including antibiotics. This renders standard treatments ineffective leading to persistent infections and an increased risk of spread severe illness and health. What are the reasons for the spread of AMR? First is the high prevalence of communicable diseases. high burden of communicable diseases like tuberculosis diarrhea and respiratory infections that require antimicrobial treatment overburden public health system due to the limited laboratory capacity for accurate diagnosis and targeted treatment due to an overburdened healthcare system is one of the reason of spread of amr next is the poor infection control practices hygiene lapses in hospitals and clinics that facilitate the spread of resistant bacteria will increase the spread of amr injurious use over prescribing by doctors patient self medications incomplete antibiotic courses and unnecessary use of broad spectrum antibiotics create selective pressure for resistant bacteria next is the easy access unregulated over the counter availability and affordability of antibiotics lead to self medication and inappropriate use next is the lack of awareness low public understanding of amr and proper antibiotic use encourages the misuse 
and finally is the limited surveillance. Inadequate monitoring system makes it difficult to track and understand the extent of AMR. Now let us see what are the implications of the spread of antimicrobial resistance. As bacteria become more resistant, fewer antibiotics work making it harder to treat infections that were once easily manageable. This could bring us back to a time when common infections were deadly. Thus, there is limitations in treatment options. Next, AMR can make antibiotics ineffective, making it harder to treat common illness like pneumonia and urinary tract infections. This can lead to longer illness, more severe symptoms and higher death rates, having an healthcare impact. AMR increases the risk of infections during surgeries, cancer treatments and organ transplants, making these procedures more dangerous. Thus, there is challenges in medical procedures. And finally, treating resistant infections is more expensive and often require long hospital stays and more complex treatment which raises healthcare cost for everyone, thus having an increased healthcare cost. For a country like India, because of this out of expenditure is such a huge problem. Now let us see what are the measures taken to address AMR, measures by the Indian government. First is the national program on AMR containment. It started in 2012. This program strengthens AMR tracking by setting up labs in state medical colleges. Next is national action plan on AMR. Launched in April 2017, it uses a One Health approach involving multiple government departments. This One Health approach is a budding concept when it comes to science. So have a look at it. The next measure is the AMR Surveillance and Research Network. It established in 2013 to monitor drug resistant infections and gather evidence. Next is the AMR research and international collaboration. The Indian Council of Medical Research that is ICMR works with the international partners like Norway and Germany to develop new treatment and strengthen research. Next is the antibiotic stewards program. The ICMR's pilot program aims to reduce misuse and overuse of antibiotics in hospitals and finally ban on fixed dose combinations that is FTCs. The Drug Controller General of India DCGI has banned 40 inappropriate FTCs. Now looking at finally the global measures taken for the AMR. First is the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, an annual campaign since 2015 to raise global awareness about AMR and promote best practices. Next is the Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System or abbreviated as GLASS. It was launched by WHO that is World Health Organization in 2015 where GLASS collects data on AMR in humans, medicine use, food and the environment. And finally is the Global Point Prevalence Survey Methodology. WHO's method to track antimicrobial use in hospitals through repeated surveys with some studies conducted in India has helped in having a measure in the AMR process. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to give a like, comment and a share. And to further not to miss any other contents, subscribe to our channel. Thank you and have a nice day.